Hi, this is Miss Slitton, and this is a little small group of excellent honors biologists concerned about their final. Say hi. Hi. Okay, I'm super proud of you. Um, now, this is a good thing because what you want to do, because we're a few weeks out from actually taking our final, right? But as I talk through and kind of remind you of things that we discussed in Unit 1, what you probably want to do is make note of those things, like I would put them in a column like, I'm scared, not so scared, confident, or however you want to break it up. And that way you know what kind of things do you need to study. I would, you could take a picture of that, but this same chart was in our unit review when we actually took our test. So I don't envision us going a long time today, but I want you to use this to analyze when you think about these things, what comes to your mind? What kind of things do you think of or do you need to revisit it? All right, so let's start with chapter 33. First of all, do you know the definition of ecology? Anybody want to go for it? Brave young Padawan? Yes. The study of animal behavior. The study of animal behaviors within their environment. environment. How different organisms r respond to other organisms in their environment. But then we looked at populations and we looked at types of growth curves. Do you remember the two types of growth curves that we had? Yeah. Logistic and exponential. Which one of those said, eat and drink for tomorrow we may die? Exponential. So those are the ones where when they were reproducing, right, we might see something like, like this on for a, a chart, right? And, and they w would go until they hit a crash. And so these animals, do they tend to be small or large? Small. Did they mature early or late? Early, yeah. Few offspring or many offspring? Many offspring, yeah. What was the other kind of growth curve? This was the exponential, this one was logistical, right? It still had an exponential time, but then it slowed down when it started to reach the what? Caring capacity. And that was the maximum number of individuals that environment could support continuously. And so sometimes it's a little above and sometimes it's a little bit below. And that was called a logistical growth curve. These organisms tend to be what? large and they mature what? Late and they have what? Few offspring. Okay. And we talked about different factors that can regulate those curves. Am I at that place? Oh, by the way, which one, what, okay. So an R species would be which one? On the left or on the right? Yeah, this would be R and this would be K. And the K stands for what? Carrying capacity. Then we talked about things that could regulate either one of those growth curves. And that's where we said density independent and density dependent. If you're worried about numbers, a maximum number of individuals that can, that can be supported, then you are probably regulated by density dependent. Does that mean you could still be regulated by density independent? Sure, but more than likely, the type of factors that you're going to be doing are density, density dependent regulation, where this would be density what? What's an example of density independent factors? Weather. What? Weather. Weather, exactly. What else? Amount of water that you have, things that are a what? Biotic. Biotic. What are some examples of density dependent factors? Disease, what else? Competition. Competition, exactly. Whether or not you know, you're competing for mates or food, and so that is what's limiting you and your growth. Um, good, biotic potential. Biotic potential, how many offspring do you tend to have? Well. That you can look right here where you look at many offspring versus few. This one would have a high biotic potential and this one would probably have a lower biotic potential. 
But within what would be expected for you, is it still high or low? What kind of things can you use to maximize your biotic potential? How many offspring you can have? And then we talked about survivorship curves. So let me get a new page for that. Survivorship curves, you always start here at a thousand individuals. And some that are, and this is born and this is die, okay? And some, they will live out their offspring and just die when they're old. Others die early on and just a few survive to the end. And some, it just really doesn't matter, okay? It's anywhere along there. What number is this one right here? One. one, and this is two, and this is three, okay? Where does the K species, where do they fall? Yeah, they are usually here. This is K on here, and then this one would be an example of R, and these could be either one, kind of in between, K selected or R selected. So these will produce a whole lot of offspring, knowing not all of them are gonna make it, but you're, ho you're going for what, quantity or quality? Quantity. Yeah, you're going for quantity here, which is the R, whereas this one you're going for quality, investing in your young for long amounts of time before they are independent. Here, there's not a high investment. Where does a spider, where would a spider be? Three. Three is where you would find a spider, right? Where would you find an elephant? <laughs> As I have my... Okay. <laughs> he is lovely. <laughs> okay, so you might find an elephant there. You might find a bird somewhere here. Okay. Um, let's go back. What else do we have? Um, survivorship curves, oh, okay. Habitat versus niche and the competitive exclusion principle. All right, so habitat, habitat versus niche. What is a habitat? Where you live. Okay, so habit, habitat is where you live and niche is what you do. Exactly. So you can have several different species living in the same habitat but they will only have one niche, right? Niches are specific. And so there was something called the competitive exclusion principle, right? Which says no two species can occupy the exact same niche for any length of time. What's going to happen if they do? Yep. An option if they if they don't is one will die and one will live. What's another option they could do? Yes. Yes. Another option is resource partitioning. So that means, for instance, if you have a tree that some animals might choose to live at the top of the tree. Some might be walking around the bottom of the tree. Some live in the middle of the tree. So they are partitioning out this resource, which will decrease what? Competition. It decreases competition. Okay, what did I do? Competitive exclusion. Oh, humans and age structure diagrams. All right, so let's talk about that. Well, Okay, so we have, when you look at where you can be in life, you could be, you could be pre-reproductive, you could be reproducing, what would be the other one? Post. So in your mind, do you remember when we talked about, and I probably put it on here, I did not. Um, do you remember we talked about more developed countries and less developed countries? MDCs and LDCs, which one had the pyramid shape for their age structure diagrams? These are age structure diagrams. Which one had like a pyramid triangle shape? LDCs. And what that meant is that you have a lot that are in the pre, and then this is repro, and then this is post repro. In LDCs, 
which means you have all of these off all of these children who are going to grow up and make more children and since you have more in this than the one above it you are going to have the next generation it's going to have even more children right which then means the next right even more children and so that population size is going to what go up and we talked about what are some ways to help them transition from an LDC into an MDC, and an MDC has a more stable age reproductive diagram, more of a column. What are some things we could do to move them from here to here? Education. What? Education, exactly. What else? Medicine. Medicine, exactly. They want their babies to live. If more of their babies live, they would not have as many babies. Does that make sense? excluding culture or religion all right and so um and we saw that p that populations this is happening more rapidly now because we do have the medicines to share with others and so it sometimes it sounds counterintuitive like oh my gosh don't send them food don't send them medicine there's too many of them um life ethics would say just let them die to get their numbers back but really that medicine and that food is going to help move them from an LDC to an MDC. All right, next thing we talked about, predator prey. So a predator who is who's doing the chasing and the eating and the prey is who's getting eaten. And so predators are always trying to be better predators and prey are always trying to be worse prey, right? They don't want to be eaten. Um, so we looked at some different strategies that predator and prey have, but we noticed that predator and prey do what? Remember that? The cycling. As the predator numbers go up, then the prey numbers are going to go down, which then brings the predator numbers up, which then our predator numbers down, which means the prey numbers can go up. It could be that they're directly related to cause that, or you could have a drought, and so there's not enough plant material so that the the prey numbers don't have enough to eat. So they're going down, not because they were over hunted by the predator, but just because they didn't have any food. But it will still affect the cycling of the predator regardless, because if the prey number goes down, then the predator number will go down. So we looked at different strategies, mimicry, and there were two types of mimicry in particular. Do you remember the two names? Mm -hmm. And malaria. Which one was the lie? Yeah, Batium. See if you can take the bait. I am a tasty fly, but I'm trying to look like a bee, or I'm trying to look like a spider. So I am trying to look like something that's distasteful, and I hope you take the bait and you avoid me. Malarian mimics, like the two L's in Malarian, stinger, stinger. This would be like a bee and a wasp. They both have stingers, and we hope to increase the learning curve by you knowing stick away to stay away from the black and yellow ones symbiotic relationships symbiotic relationships are always going to be a plus for one of the partnerships what are the other options plus minus, plus minus and that would be what kind parasitic parasitic okay what's another option Plus, plus, what's that? Mutualism. Mutualism, good for both. What's another one? Plus and what would that be? Mutualism. Commensalism, right? And there are more than that. Those are just the three standard ones, right? What would a tick be? Tick on a dog. A Parasitic. Parasitic. What would be um, a shark or a manta ray or something and uh, something that cleans out the teeth of them? Mutualism. Yeah, no? Mutualism. Mutualistic. Good because if you have something that's cleaning, they're getting the food that they're cleaning off and the other one's getting their parasites off them. Commensalism, the best one for that one is epiphytes. Those are plants that live on other plants high up in the canopy. So it's good for them because they don't have to have roots and they're up with all the light, um, but it doesn't hurt the plant that they're on. It doesn't do any disservice to them. And then the last thing was about uh, disturbance. And this relates to ecosystems. And what we learned, if you remember, is the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. 
intermediate disturbance type of, and it says a little bit of disturbance is good. Kind of cleans out the underbrush, you know, have that fire every once in a while. Not man-made fires like what we experienced here, but natural cycling of a little bit of disturbance. Not too great, not too small, and not too frequent, but not too infrequent. Just right. It's the porridge, okay? When um, that, that helps overall with the health of an ecosystem. Okay, that was chapter 33. Let's look at 34. 34 was probably one of the easier chapters that we had because we learned about producers like autotrophs and consumers and decomposers. We learned how energy flows through and it flows through the sun's energy, right? Starts with who? The sun. Yeah, the sun. And it goes to what? Producers, what's another name for producers? Autotrophs. Autotrophs. Then consumers, and who eats the producers? The type of consumer. You have primary consumer, what's another name for the primary consumer? Herbivore, exactly, eats the autotroph. Then who eats the herbivore? Carnivore eats the herbivore. Then decomposers can break all of them down and recycle those nutrients. And we studied that, energy flow, chemical cycling. We did food chains and food webs. Which one is more intricate? Which one is more complex? Web. A food chain is just saying um, um, you have a flower and then the nutrients from that flower is going to some bug and then that bug is eaten by some bird <laughs> and then that bird is hunted by a bigger bird <laughs> okay that is a food chain a food web is talking about how that bug can go and get eaten by i need an animal who eats bugs Oh, it's clearly a flower. I don't know why you're struggling with that at all. It's obviously a flower. What's something else that eats bugs besides birds? Spiders. Okay, spider. Okay, <laughs> and that spider could be eaten by the bird, right? There could be um, a fox involved here who also eats that bird, right? That's a food web, and that's more intricate. Um, we talked about trophic levels. Who is at the first trophic level? The flower is at the first trophic level. It's where it starts, okay? Then this guy is at the second. These guys are at the third. And this one is at the fourth, right? And you could take these trophic levels and you could stand them so they were like a pyramid first, second, third, fourth trophic level. And this is where you have your autotrophs, your primary consumer, your secondary consumer, and your tertiary consumer. But what was wrong when they drew it like that? Decomposers. Yes, it didn't show decomposers who would work on all of those. What else? Yes. The heat, or not heat, the energy that's lost. Yes, so only about 10% moves on each level. So when we show this, we really need to say, what would be 10% of this? Maybe this much, right? And then this much, and then this one. At the next level, you because you lose most of it. Only 10% gets passed on. Good. Okay, and then, oh, we learned the cycles. So what were the cycles that we learned? Water cycles, what were some key words with water cycle we wanted to know? Aquifer. Yeah, aquifer, good. What's another key word? Transpiration. Transpiration, evaporation of water out of open stomata. One that starts with this. Precipitation, evaporation, right? All of those would be with the water cycle. What's your next cycle? Pick any one you want. Okay, carbon, sure, let's talk about that. Carbon, what are some words we're gonna think about there? Okay, photosynthesis, exactly. 
Photosynthesis will do what to the CO2? Make it go down. Where are you? Come back to me. Right? Photosynthesis reduces the amount of CO2. What kind of things increase CO2? Cellular respiration, combustion, right? Decomposition. Those kind of things increase CO2. All right, what's another cycle? Yes, phosphorus. Where's phosphorus stored? It's usually in rocks. How do you get it out of the rocks? Erosion. And it is a limiting nutrient, which means that it usually keeps all the other thing, um, cycles, organisms in check because there's not too much of it. And remember, for each one of these, we said man can screw them up. We can, can pollute water. We can pull water out of aquifers. And so you have these sinkholes. We can do too much um, combustion and really increase the amount of CO2, which is linked to global warming. We can put too many phosphates in the soil, which then causes an algal bloom. Okay, and what was the last cycle we did? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen. And key things there is nitrogen fixation, going from the air to a solid. Nitrification, first nitrites, then nitrates. We talked about uh, atmospheric fixation, going from N2 directly to nitrates. We said or plants could eat these nitrates and animals could eat the plants. And then we talked about decomposition back into um, ammonia. And then we talked about denitrifying bacteria, which return it to the environment. All right, you guys are doing awesome. This was like five weeks of work and we're doing it and we wrap you know. Okay, did I hit everything? I did, right? Okay, so we are on chapter 32. I think I put a list there, here it is. Okay, nature versus nurture, okay? What were some example of, of nature determining our behavior? What were some examples we looked at? Snakes? Mm -hmm. and food choice. What else? Remember the birds and their nest building and twin studies? That shows us that the behavior we have is in our DNA. Remember with snakes, it was whether or not they preferred slugs. And what we found out is ultimately it came down to how many times they flicked their tongues. And if they flicked their tongues a lot, they could taste the slugs. And if they didn't flick their tongues very often, they couldn't taste the slugs or you know, detect the slugs in the environment, so they didn't eat them. Um, nurture, that had to do with learning. We talked about things like imprinting, when birds learn the song, right? Was it, what are some other things we did with learning? Associative, Associative right? And we looked at classical conditioning and we looked at um, Pavlov's dogs and that you could train them. They would just, something that is a physiological response like salivating. Sweating is a physiological response, right? And what you could do is you could induce that physiological response by connecting something that induces it, like ringing the bell before you brought the food. So they would start to salivate early. Um, then there was operant conditioning. And this is at the end of it, perform, like make your bed, you get a treat. Get an A, you get a new car, okay? That is rewards-based, where you get something as a result of it. Okay, so that's, a, so, oh, da, 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 oh, let's talk, oh, I did talk, you remember what imprinting is? Okay, so like teaching a bird a song or salmon imprint on the smell of the water. Okay, mating, ma okay, female choice, territory, sexual dimorph, okay. Do you remember there were two theories about female choice? Do you remember what those two were? Yep. And that was where it was all about, right, looks. Remember that? It was like how many feathers you had. Like who has a bunch of feathers? Peacock. Peacock. Good. And what was the other one? Good gene. Good gene. Big, strong can provide, that would be the good gene hypothesis. 
leading to sexual dimorphism. This is saying males and females look different from each other. And in the bird world, who's actually prettier? Males, because they're trying to attract a mate, and the females are trying to hide because they're sitting on some eggs, right? So it, it creates differences. The competition come out from the males trying to get themselves some females. They may fight for each other, they may try to have a better territory to get the female, do a special dance to do it. Um, when we talked about fitness, fitness is not how many push-ups you can do, it's your ability to pass on your what? Genes, your DNA. Um, sociobiology and altruism. Sociobiology assumes that you're living in a group and you know how to behave in that group and the role that you play. You knew when you came in this room, it might be a good idea to get a computer. You knew to sit on the desk, not the floor. You knew how to ask questions. That's part of your sociobiology. When we talked about specifically altruism, that's talking about what looks like an apparent sacrifice of your living self for the benefit of other for no apparent reason, okay? You going to an English review or a Spanish review for a friend who doesn't even, you don't take Spanish, but you go to the Spanish review and take copious notes and give it to your friend. And you go, why did we do that? And what it turns out is, what looks to be altruism is really a form of selfishness. Because they're trying to protect what? Their, friendship. yeah, friendship in that case, or their offspring. And so they're saying, look, the reason why I stand on the hill and scream, even though the hawk could come and eat me, is I'm trying to protect my young. Or I know I'll stand today because somebody else will stand tomorrow. And that's called reciprocal altruism. I'll regurgitate a blood meal to you because I know if I get in dire straits, you will reciprocate a blood meal to me. If we're taking care of relatives, it's called or it's called kin selection. But if we're doing you know, favors, I'll groom you today because tomorrow you'll groom me. That's reciprocal altruism. Okay, and last but not least, for ways to communicate. Now, let's look at these four ways and which ones are fast. Is auditory fast? Yeah, that's like, stop. Okay, that's very fast. Is visual fast? Is tactile fast? Could be if I'm near you, right? That's iffy. Is chemical fast? No, usually slower, because it's got to travel, right? Unless it's a skunk, and then that's going to be pretty fast, right? Um, which ones work during the daytime primarily? Visual. Visual works during the daytime. Does auditory? Yeah, yeah day and yeah. night. Does tactile work day and night? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how about chemical? Right? And then we had examples. For auditory, it could be a bird call. Visual, it could be signs of being angry and making your hair stand up. Um, tactile, the big one there was what? The bee. And the bee, remember they were doing their waggle dance. They'd come around, waggle, 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 come around. And those waggles communicated two things. Direction and distance. And we said, if you think of the top of the hive as where the sun is, then the angle you're doing your dance is the same angle when you leave the hive, fly at that angle and that's the direction you will find the food. How far you fly depends on the number of waggles and that is species specific. Wow, questions? Do you feel smarter? Okay, tell the person next to you, which ones do you think of this do you need to spend some time Reviewing which ones do you think need a little bit more of your attention and Tell that to your friend right now and if you're reviewing I hope you have a piece of toast if you're hungry and you make a good choice. Yes. Are you okay with oh, yes, sorry. Don't eat that toast yet I forgot about that. I had it on here. A chi-square test Okay, so we um, put some roly-polies in three different situations. Here, um, here is, initially we put them here. Here is sugar, water, and vinegar. We let the test run for 30 minutes and we look at their options here. 
Okay. I would say, what does it look like they're doing? Yeah, they're going for the sugar. What we need to know is, is it statistically significant? So when we look at here, we go, okay, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I think I put 10. I did. Okay, so there were 10 roly polies initially. Okay, so we would expect there to be 10 roly polies when we're done. How many roly polies are here? Zero. Okay, I don't think they like vinegar. How many roly polies are here? Five. five. How, so how many roly polies? If this is 10, 20, 30, how much have to be here? 25. So we would take what we observed minus, remember this, um, chi squared equals the observed minus expected squared over what we expect, which would be 10 in each one, yeah? So here we observe 25, so 25 minus 10 squared over 10 plus 5 minus 10 squared over 10 and 0 minus 10 squared over 10. Take a minute to do the math there. What's 25 minus 10? Okay, so this is 15 squared over 10. This plus 5 minus 10 is what? Negative 5. 5 times 5, oh, or that would be 5 squared over 10 plus what's this one? 10 squared over 10, yes? Okay. Are you doing the math on your computers? What's 15 times 15? 225? So if we divide that by 10, it would be 22.5, right? Do you agree with that? And then what's 5, divi five times 5 is? 25 divided by 10 would be what? 2.5. 10 times 10 is 100 divided by 10 is 10. So when we add this up, that's 25, 26, 27, 28, 38 is our chi-squared value. Does that sound statistically significant? Yes. How many degrees of freedom do we have? It's the number of choices we have, we have minus one. So if we have three choices minus one, we would have two degrees of freedom. And I think with two degrees of freedom, you know, it's not gonna be, I can tell you, it's not gonna be 38. That's a really big number. And think about it just logically. If you get a really big chi-squared number, a really big chi-squared number, what that says is the difference from what I expected was really large. So therefore, something must be up. And in this case, what's up? They like what? Sugar, and they don't like vinegar. And I can say with certainty, statistically, there's enough there to make a difference. Had I had another option where it was like 10 in one and eight in another and 12 in another, do you think that's gonna be statistically significant? No. When we take the deviation squared, that's gonna be a very small number from what I expected of 10, 10, and 10, like a null hypothesis. And so in that case, I know eh, that didn't have a big impact on its choices. Now are you good? Thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate it. Now have your piece of toast. Don't forget to study. I hope you're watching this sooner rather than later, and you're super smart, and I love you in a non-creepy teacher way. I, now i got to have that on there.